Now, what would you say to a new business owner? A new business owner? Um, stick with it. Oh, God damn it. Mm -hmm. Stick with it. There's going to be ups and downs and the ups are the great part and the downs not so great But if you can survive those downs <laughs> I can't do it. Mm -hmm. You know over the long run it, you don't success doesn't happen overnight, but uh, Yeah, I'm uh, I'm done with Pine Bluff I'm done with Pine Bluff Dear Murphy user, Unfortunately, Murphy has ceased operations. The senior debt holders of the company will determine the process by which you may retrieve any physical media that you may have stored in Murphy and will be in contact regarding it. Thank you for your support over the years. The Murphy Team This was the message thousands of disappointed Murphy users received when the company went under. Murphy was a startup based out of Madison, Wisconsin, whose business was to store and digitize physical media collections and then offer them for streaming on the cloud. Now I know what you're thinking. Why the fuck would somebody who already owns a piece of physical media pay another person to keep that physical media and play it for them? That just sounds like having a DJ with a bunch of unnecessary and overly expensive steps. Well try and picture it like this for a minute. You're a collector, a collector of an ancient form of media called physical music. You single-handedly keep your local record store afloat by buying whole rolls of classic records, CDs, and cassette tapes in bulk. Walmart still sells CDs in 2023 specifically to cater to your antique taste. And let's be real, bro, that's exactly what you're collecting. Antiques. Shit, you might not even own a record player. Now is that going to stop you from impulse buying every Pink Floyd vinyl you come across? No! Is that going to stop you from buying physical albums of bands from your local scene that you and like 13 other people have seen live? No! You're collecting all them shits like they're infinity stones. And why do you do it? Because you love music? No niggas cause you're a filthy hoarder. A physical music hoarder but a hoarder nonetheless. I mean look at this, I mean, I mean really. This is all rock and this is jazz over here. I just want to stop doing it. From his living room to the hallway to the basement and attic, it's all records. Everywhere except my bathroom. Your bathroom? Doesn't have any records and it's too moist. And like all hoarders, you really have no business owning all of the shit you do. You really don't. I mean, how often do you actually listen to significant chunks of the music you've obtained? How many of these CDs and cassettes have you only played once and never finished, or have never even played at all? You don't know, because you're like a squirrel collecting nuts. You were never going to eat all that. You just keep stacking them, and stacking them, because the act of doing so shoots off those happy neurons in your brain. But eventually, the uncomfortable question rears its ugly head. What are you actually going to do with all this stuff? How do you justify to your friends and family this giant collection of outdated media you retain that stands cluttered in stacks ready to topple over like it's a Chinese ghost city? Well, for people of that audiophilic persuasion, they were finally able to find some light at the end of the tunnel, thanks to Murphy. Now they could send all of their Stone Age ass media to some hipsters in Wisconsin who, for a generous fee, would keep their music stored and play it at the user's convenience via streaming from the cloud. Well, that was until Murphy got shut down. And why did it get shut down? Well, the founder, Preston Austin, he doesn't really know. He was off running a separate music service and left the reins of Murphy in his fellow music hipster's hands. Now, I actually do know why Murphy got shut down. Google Cloud Costs. See, all the storage it takes to host all this media is where most of the money goes for these types of businesses. Murphy being no different. The cost for hosting over hundreds of thousands of individual pieces of music especially proved to be pretty goddamn costly. So the dudes at Murphy had to look for solutions. And the Google Cloud service provider presented them one by recommending some changes to the way the storage was done. The guys at Murphy went through with this glad to finally be able to cut some costs. At least that's what they thought they were doing. 
What actually happened was, because of these changes they made, they got hit with a surprise $30,000 bill for data egress at the end of the month. And this was the final straw that broke the company, which was already unprofitable for years because of cloud costs they couldn't afford. And if they couldn't afford that, they definitely couldn't afford to burn through 360 k a year. So, Murphy was done. Truly a tragedy for audiophiles everywhere, especially its users who now weren't sure if they were ever going to see their music again. See, Murphy had a clause that, for a small fee, they would send all of the music in their possession back to the owners if the company ever shuttered. But with everything having suddenly imploded, Murphy's former customers weren't sure if that was even still on the table. It was quite the predicament. But when all seemed lost, the Murphanese had a hero descend to stop their records from being buried in some Wisconsin landfill. He came in the form of an autistic entrepreneur and tech savant named John Finley. Hi, my name is John Finley, and I started a company called Crossies.com. John Finley, also known by his ubiquitous internet sobriquet, Pontifier, is an entrepreneur, inventor, futurist, real estate investor, and a married father of three from Provo, Utah. He also dabbled in politics for a bit, once running for mayor of Provo back in 2017. Unfortunately for John, his political ideas were just a little too ambitious for his fellow Provoans, because out of the 12,879 votes counted in the 2017 Provo City election, he received a grand total of 98. Apparently, the city of Provo didn't want to elect somebody who was going to disincorporate it out of existence. Well, there's the disincorporation of Provo that I am pushing for, Get it, gathering enough signatures to call for a vote as to whether or not Provo should continue as a city. I think there are so many restrictive ordinances here in Provo that the easiest way to get rid of the ones that are oppressive, even if there are some good ordinances, is to just get rid of all of it. John's political takes were just a little too high IQ for his fellow Provoans to digest. And I'm not just saying that sarcastically. John's really got a noggin on him. Yes, I have had my IQ tested. I scored um, at the upper limit of the waist three, uh, where it stops being accurate. But yeah, he probably wasn't that bummed out about it, considering he told the voters, hey, if you don't like me, just go vote for somebody else. I don't know. I really don't know the views of the other candidates that well. Uh, but if you like them better, then you should vote for them. And they took his advice to heart. See, this is both a strength and a weakness for John. He's an honest, straightforward type of guy, almost to a fault. He'll keep it real with someone, even if doing so would be detrimental to himself. And this is why he opened a makerspace in Provo to begin with, and why John was really big on allowing as many people who wanted to make use of it to be allowed to. Uh, I'm pretty passionate about providing opportunities to people. We don't charge anybody a membership to come use the makerspace. We have one piece of equipment that's pretty expensive to operate, and we charge $55 an hour to operate the water jet, but pretty much everything else is free. We don't charge membership, and we don't turn anybody away. See, John Finley is a man who thinks that the future looks bright. He's a true futurist who thinks we're just a couple decades away from solving most of humanity's problems. I am a futurist. I believe that much of the technology that we see, much of the problems that we experience right now, they'll be solved by technology. In fact, he's so much of a futurist that he's taken the steps to ensure that he'll literally live forever to be able to see the future. So I, I take the long view of the future and I wanna see the future. So I actually do intend to live forever. I don't think that I will die ever. Um, and I've taken steps to ensure that I don't. Um, I am signed up for an organization called Alcor that is a cryonics institute down in, uh, in Scottsdale, Arizona. I wear, I wear a necklace, a little, I wear a little uh, medical alert necklace that says, you know, in case I die, do this to my body so that uh, they can you know, call, call them down in Arizona and they'll come out and, and freeze my head so that I can uh, be revived hopefully in the future. 
So Phil and Mario run aside, how's a guy like this end up being Murphy's Messiah? Well, it all starts with John's love for music. While he isn't a straight up audiophile with a robust collection like a lot of Murphy's users, he did find himself becoming more of a music connoisseur in his later college days. Enough so for him to develop, among a bunch of other things, a music streaming service startup called Crossies, which would store and digitize physical media collections and then offer them for streaming on the cloud. Our users send us their music and movies and we make it digitally available on all their devices through the cloud. Oh hey, you know, that, that sounds familiar. That sounds a lot like Murphy. Yeah, coincidentally, John just happened to be running his own music startup that ran almost identically to Murphy. Now, unfortunately for our guy, he was struggling to find investors he needed for his startup. To add to this, in mid-2019, he was issued an eviction notice for his building in LA. But I was out in California uh, looking at, uh, you know, to start, trying to start my business and I needed a warehouse. But I was also living with my uncle who got evicted. We started looking at real estate in California. It was so expensive. And this wasn't the first time John had trouble keeping a building for one of his enterprises. A few years earlier in his hometown of Provo, he started looking for a place to relocate his makerspace because his landlord had been jacking up the rent. And one location that really caught his eye the most was an abandoned jail in town. It's in pretty good condition. Just some, just some tiles down in the ceiling. Fine. It had been vandalized, had a lot of copper stripped out of it and had a little bit of an asbestos problem. But hey, from John's view, fixing all that would have been light work. He's a real estate guy after all, and he knew a thing or two about rehabbing distressed properties. See, I don't see any structural damage at the foundation. Here's like loading back area. There is no structural damage to this building. But just like with the election, John's fellow Provoans just weren't filling his vision, and the city ended up selling it to a developer who promptly had the jail demolished. And this left John seething. I guess there's no, I guess there's no going back. Boy, it sure looks like that's a sturdy building they're driving that thing around inside. Wow. Why in the world did they want to dis demolish this thing? <sighs> it's so ridiculously stupid. He wanted that jailhouse bad, enough that he was willing to throw down hundreds of thousands of dollars just to renovate it. He decided that no matter where it was in the country, if he could find a place with as much or more space in that jail and that was within his target price range, he would buy it. And he actually did find it. A few months even before Murphy announced his termination, John had already purchased his dream location. So when John caught wind of Murphy's demise, he found himself with spare cash on hand and a suitable location on deck in a perfect spot to act. And he did, by buying the whole operation. He bought a plane ticket, flew to Wisconsin, met everyone who had been involved with running Murphy, and had all of Murphy's assets transferred to the Crossies LLC, which, was just him buying a million CDs, pretty much. But hey, Murphy was saved. Hi, my name is John Fenley, and I've just purchased the assets of Murphy. This, of course, was music to the ears of Murphy's former users, something they thought they were never going to hear again. Not only would John continue to run Murphy's service as it was being ran before, since it was pretty much just the same service as Crossy's, he also presented a new opportunity for some of Murphy's users to get their music back. Well, that's what he said he was gonna do. But then... My plan was to pull discs out of the boxes as I moved them, and it started to work. But more and more people decided they needed their discs back immediately. And it's not gonna be possible for me to open all of these boxes before the move to Arkansas. So I've made an executive decision to stop doing returns until we get to Arkansas. As it turns out, trying to sift through over a million pieces of physical media is absurdly fucking time consuming and tedious. 
almost like the average person stopped using CDs and cassettes to listen to music for a reason. So returning of any audio paraphernalia was put on hold for now. But whatever, at least it was all being moved to a new, safe, safe, safe home in a beautiful Arkansas town called Pine Bluff. In ordinary circumstances, well, as ordinary as a nerdy nigga from Utah buying a million CDs could be, I could see this story I'm about to tell you panning out way differently. But our guy John made one mistake. Possibly the worst mistake of his life, because he might actually end up losing his life. Excuse me. I mean, having his head frozen and thrown into stasis because of this mistake. And that mistake? is that he obviously didn't do the due diligence he should have done before setting up shop in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. So I did a nationwide search for the largest square footage, lowest price, and found this place Look at in that. Pine Bluff, Arkansas. That's amazing. It's, uh, you know, like the largest, largest building I've ever seen. And it was so cheap. And that's what brought me here. It's so obvious that he just looked at the size of the building and then looked at the price listing and then said, I'm in that home. But like, bro, you don't need to be inside of every hoe. Just like you don't trust a big butt and a smile, you don't trust a warehouse complex with a low price tag. And initially, it's hard to blame, bro. Just look at this bitch. It's a monstrous 220,000 square feet metal warehouse with an office complex on 17 acres. Could you believe that John was literally cruising through one of them in a golf cart going at 20 miles per hour without even worrying about having to hit anything? It's ridiculous. Could you believe he bought all of this for only 375 k Well, if you did, you would be wrong. He actually bought it for three-fourths of that price. The previous owners of this property were really eager, for some reason, to get this thing off their hands. John, naturally, didn't find anything weird about this auspiciously good bargain. No, instead, his plan started to grow in proportion to the buildings he had just purchased. He now had plans besides just storing a bunch of CDs in there. He wanted to make another makerspace, just like the one he had in Provo, but bigger, way bigger. We're talking John wants to build the biggest makerspace in the US. But wait, John didn't just stop at wanting to make a new makerspace. He also wanted to make a science museum. Let me just go ahead and spoil this for you now. None, and I mean none, of these plans of John Finley have come to fruition in between the time he bought Murphy and me making this video. Literally none of them. And it's not on any sort of shysty behavior on John. He's not a scammer. He's not lazy. What he is, is just kind of naive and maybe a little autistic. Well, maybe more than a little, but you get what I'm saying. Had John known what he was getting into when he bought this building, this might have all been prevented. But some people just gotta learn things the hard way. Really, John should have known something was up when he first arrived in town and found a 7-Eleven that was closed. Have you ever seen a closed 7-Eleven before? Because I haven't. It's just like a Waffle House. They don't shut down unless something really, really bad is going down. The second clue John should have picked up on was that filling up your gas tank in Pine Bluff cost a little bit more than buying a variety pack of Capri Suns. It's like the city was telling them, here you go bro, your gas tank's full. You got a full trip's worth. Now turn around and go back to fucking Utah. But no. Our man, John, persisted. While you could just feel the giddiness, the optimism radiating from this man in every video and photo he posted during this time, you could already start to see the omens, the black clouds forming in the background. Like when John found evidence of a failed arson attempt in one of his new offices. This is, this is uh, one of the things that I found that really makes me think someone was trying to burn this place down. There's a lighter right down here. 
burn near the lighter. This pile of burned papers. This just looks, I mean, this looks like somebody was trying to make it look like the place burned down just by accident, but they, they, were, they couldn't get it to work. This was close. Like they, like they burned something hoping that it would catch some stuff that was like piled up against the door here. They were hoping this place would go up and it didn't. So this was a failed arson attempt. Boy, that's just crazy. Like that's insane. You know what would actually be crazier? You know what would actually be more absurd than buying a new building and then coming in to find that somebody had tried and failed to set it on fire? You know what would be actually more insane than that? This is a high crime area, um, but it can be secured. The, the media will be secure here. Um, it's just this place has been abandoned for so long that that people have been scrapping metal out of this place, like uh, the walls here. The walls here, somebody actually stole the walls. They stole his walls. Somebody stole my nigga's walls. Somebody literally broke into his fucking warehouse before he had even set up shop and stole this dude's walls. Like, where do you go from here? How could you possibly see a future in a city where niggas are stealing walls? Even in Detroit, they don't steal walls. Your wall is the only thing Detroit niggas won't steal. This was the last omen that flew over John's head. He still persisted. He had no electricity, he had no running water, and he was already having to deal with thieves that stole everything that wasn't pinned down and stole some of the shit that was. But hey, in John's mind, it would all work out in the end once the city finally allowed him to use his building. No permit for the construction, occupancy, or operation of any facility or improvement described herein shall be granted nor shall any activity authorized by this permit be conducted on the premises until... Da -da 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 -da. I've got to get a whole bunch of permits. Permits involve architectural drawings. I can't unload the containers until I get architectural drawings done of the whole facility and have it inspected by, by the city and who knows how long that's gonna take. I'm exploring other options. It should have been around this time that John finally started to realize that maybe he made a mistake getting invested in Pine Bluff. But it wasn't. It wasn't this specific moment that made this clear to him. It was this moment. I'm out here trying to protect these containers and I'm not allowed to go in the buildings because of the stupid red tape. And I'm out here totally exposed. And uh, yeah, someone had a gun in my face. My nigga got the burner shoved in his face in broad fucking daylight. This, this right here. This is when John finally realized I probably should have did a bit more research before buying this building. Cause it's obvious he didn't. It's obvious he didn't do any research. I have though, I have done the research. So let's do a quick dive on Pine Bluff, Arkansas, better known to the rest of Arkansas as Prime Bluff. I want you to stop and take a minute to think about all the cities in the US that have the worst reputations. Now maybe they're not actually the worst places in the country, maybe they're pretty cool to live in so long as you live in the good parts, but they still got a bit of infamy to them. I want you to take those infamous traits, leave out all of the good shit, throw them all together, and you've got Pine Bluff, Arkansas, aka Crime Bluff. It's got Chicago and New Orleans corruption, it's got Baltimore and St. Louis's gang violence, and it's got Portland's retarded city council. The police crackdown on public busking has forced me to rely on inferior art forms such as miming and jesting for alternative incomes. This won't be as much of a problem when the pandemic ends and I can go back to gigging as a party clown, but you know, clunk on wood, as I like to say. Yeah, Pine Bluff has everything. Everything except low crime rates. Well, hold on, that's not true. It actually has a lot of beautiful natural scenery. 
I mean, just look at all that nature. It's kind of hard to miss when it's devouring abandoned buildings because the city refuses to either let people rehabilitate these buildings and make them suitable for human life or just straight up demolish them and let developers build some new shit on top. Let's see all of these. Oh, oh, dilapidated buildings. Yeah, Culver Town is it. Yeah, yeah, two, two weeks, 1999. <laughs> right, it just, this is downtown, but nothing's downtown. So you've seen a little bit, a few glimpses of what Pine Bluff is about. But let me give you a couple facts and statistics that really illuminate this very special city for you. Let's start off with the murder rate. The national average for murders in the US is seven per 100,000 people. Now I know what you're thinking. Wow, that's actually way lower than I thought it would be. Me too, I thought it was gonna be way higher than that. Pine Bluff lives up to the hype with a murder rate of 50 per 100,000 people. A murder rate of 50 per 100,000 in a city of 40,000. That's declining every year. That is a 300% deviation from the national average. And it doesn't end there. The amount of Pine Bluffians living under the poverty line in 2021 was roughly 20%, almost twice the national average of roughly 11%, and still higher than the average of roughly 16% for its state. Pine Bluff has managed to be poor by the standards of the state of Arkansas, which is the fifth poorest state in the union. And then we have the education and graduation rates. Look, I don't wanna rag on children in Pine Bluff. It's not their fault. They could have been born literally anywhere else in the world. And they just happen to be one of the 40,000 people born in one of the most third world ass cities you could find in a first world country. And I do mean born, because ain't nobody moving to Pine Bluff, except for John. Of course. And it's sad because shit, we only 30, what, maybe, maybe 40,000 people now. It used to be about a good 50, 60,000 people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, half of the city is gone to Whitehall. I mean, well, a good large majority, maybe 20%. And the rest have just jetted, you know, jetted off. You know, crime raised, then, you know, the poverty level. Oh shit, I need some money, you know what I'm saying? I, if, if I can't get it here, hell, I'm going up, you know, up the road. Pretty much every problem in Pine Bluff comes down to the fact that the city's local government it's just bad. It's just bad. It's it's just shit. The inspector came, said it was okay, but the paperwork needed to be done. Right. Never did any paperwork. He he said he tried to, and that your office blocked it. Do you remember from Rocco Cruz? Do you remember when all this stuff was going on? They went to the inspection. And they went to the inspection. Calvin over there. Uh -huh. Did not pull a permit. Well, they told me he couldn't. Okay. That he can't. I still don't know exactly what I'm supposed to do. Some would say the city's politicians are corrupt, which they are. A lot of them are. Me personally, I think a lot of them are just retarded. What do you want the water on for? So we can flush the toilets. There's no occupancy in the building. Why would you want to? Why do you need that if you're not occupying the building? This is just a syndicate of mostly underqualified people with backward ass ideas of how to efficiently run a municipality. And this incompetence trickles down Ronald Reagan style onto the rest of the city. Everything in Pine Bluff is inefficient. The police are inefficient. The fire department is inefficient. The schools are inefficient. And the zoning department is inefficient. Um, I don't know exactly what your your plan is. I heard you say something about 100 houses. But when it comes time for it to go to go up for condemnation, only two of them might go because these two guys stopped the process. You know, what, what she's saying is, some, even though if you notice, she may write up all the 28th Street. But all, remember I told you there's multiple factors. You look at a timeline. If, if uh, 10 of those write up at the same time, you would assume they all would, 91 days, three months from now, that 
ten would be coming before DMP. Well, if it doesn't, if it doesn't, if it doesn't receive, let's say they don't receive the first notice, then you got to run it in the newspaper. They don't receive the second notice. You got to run it in the newspaper. Half of them don't receive notice. You got to run it in the newspaper, but the other half flows through. Well, you got only five out of the ten that comes up. So that's that's what she's saying, and I understand that. Let these be lessons for new and future real estate investors and agents out there. Do research on the ground, on the city, and not just the farm area of the properties that you're buying into. Because otherwise, you're gonna end up like John, dealing with hood niggas, rednecks, and retarded city officials every fucking day for three years of your life that you could have spent raising your kids in Utah. The politics of the city is fucked up. The politicians specifically are fuck ups. But you know what, hey, somebody elected these people. It takes two to tango. And while the politicians ain't great, the average Pine Bluffian plays his own important role in making his city one of the worst places in the country. You gotta keep in mind that Pine Bluff is not an ordinary bad city. In ordinary bad cities, the politicians are normally safe from all of the lunchtime rowdies causing a ruckus about town. Uh, that's not the case in Pine Bluff. In Pine Bluff, crime touches every inch of the city and the people who live in it, including the politicians, whether they're still in office or not. A man has been arrested after being caught on camera robbing a Pine Bluff councilwoman at gunpoint. Well, three assault rifles were all pointed at Pine Bluff councilwoman Joni Alexander outside of her home early Sunday morning. The robbers took over $4,000 of her belongings in just one swipe. Pine Bluff City Councilwoman Joni Alexander was robbed by three men at gunpoint. Not only was it one big gun, it was two, three big guns. Alexander is grateful the men didn't shoot her, but after they snagged her purse, shots were fired as they ran off. Does it take all of that to rob a woman of her purse? And just like with this former councilwoman, John has had plenty of time in the past few years to get well acquainted with some of Pine Bluff's finest. Did you just do that? Yeah. What the fuck? What the fuck happened, man? What the fuck? What the fuck? Look at this mangy dog. This isn't even the worst one. This isn't even the worst one. What are we gonna do about this? I don't know, you're a dog, man. Look at your door. You see the paper that's on there taped to your door? Because it's for you, man. Notice of breach to Josh Schmall from John Fenley. This notice is to inform you that you are not in compliance with your rental agreement, rubbish and clutter outside of leased area. Failure to procure required insurance policy, occupancy of premises without occupancy permit, pets on premises, and Arkansas code 18-17-601, paragraph seven, disturbing peaceful enjoyment by others. I don't have a dog policy. You got dog policy. It's like an allowed landlord to do it. I'll allow you to do it yourself. All right, get the fuck out. Take care of your fucking kids. Go see them, nigga. You never talk about that. 
Apparently, this guy might have also stolen John's van and possibly set one of the houses he bought in Pine Bluff on fire. Believe it or not, he was actually one of the nicer Pine Bluffians John has had to deal with. You can say a lot about John Finley, but you cannot look down on his dedication, on his will, on his autism. Because John wasn't going to let the fact that he had no real access to his building, no electricity or running water or any amenities at all going through it, he wasn't going to let any of that stop him from getting work done. I am here at the lake in Pine Bluff. I, uh have kind of abandoned my facility at this point. I can't work through the red tape with the city. No power over there. No uh, no ability to unload the containers. So uh, I'm doing the next best thing. I've got uh, security over there watching the containers. The containers are all locked up. I've got uh, mobile processing stations uh, and connected over to the county building with Wi-Fi. I've got power. Uh, this is basically all I need. I can do the, do the things that I need to do here. I am determined, no amount of red tape, no amount of of barriers is gonna stop me from doing the right thing for the Murphy customers. John decided that fuck it. I can't go in my building to work. I'll just work outside. I'll just work in a tent. He even got a new cargo container brought over just so he could start separating and organizing things outside of his building. It's all so admirable. But John just didn't realize that no amount of grind setting can outgrind the bluff. <laughs> I just found out that Pine Bluff is the, the fastest shrinking place in the entire country. <laughs> this is around the time where John finally starts to actually lose his fucking mind. It's fully sunk in that this city is just ads. It's the fastest shrinking city in the US because everyone who lives there knows it's ass. The crime is bad. The politicians are bad. The state of the city is bad. It's just a city where everything is bad all of the time. And John, with his over-optimistic ass, financially chained his business to this failed city. So eventually, he, he just throws his hands up and decides, I'm gonna take this straight to the city council. And he did. Hi, my name is John Penley. I am the owner of Murphy.com, a business that's been trying to move here for the last two years. Would you like to tell any of my 40,000 customers why I cannot get permits to use my building that meets my requirements? It's a metal building with a concrete floor, and I'd like to unload some merchandise into it. The city of progress that you guys are killing by destroying every building in this town. I only see demolition happen in this town. It's shrinking. And any, any vacant building owner, has to register their vacant building if you guys are going to charge them, but yet you're not going to let people get permits to fix their buildings? That sounds like a perfect storm. There is a process, Mr. Finley, that you have to go through to get buildings qualified for any kind of improvements. You need an architect, you need a plumber, you need an electrician, you need these kinds of things. There are regulations that one must follow. But maybe you should. Unfortunately, just like back in Provo, the Pine Bluff City Council just wasn't feeling his vision. They treated him like a munch and left him out in the cold to be savaged by an endless onslaught of thieves. He even got on the news for it. Utah man looking to start his own business in Pine Bluff is suffering from a major problem that's holding him back, theft. All those plans kind of just have been destroyed. I, I've been robbed so many times, maybe $50,000 worth of theft over the past two and a half years. And here, two men cut the bolts off a fence and prying it open to make room for their car. It's been a challenge for Finley to get a permit from the city to get this place in shape. And the more time he waits, the more gets stolen. You would assume that at this point, after dealing with all this nonsense, he would finally just cut his losses, head back to Utah and say, fuck it. Well, you would assume wrong. In fact, the opposite happened. Not only was John going to stay in Pine Bluff, he was going to buy even more 
properties. John Finley decided that he was going to single-handedly gentrify all of Pine Bluff. This almost 80% black city was going to be mostly white owned when he was done with it. At least that's what I assume his idea was. I can't think of any other reason why he would decide to buy over 75 more properties in this city unless he was on some manifest destiny type shit. I guess price also plays a role into it because a lot of these properties were cheap. They were so cheap John said he would have felt bad for not buying them. It's just like his 375k warehouse that he paid less than 300k for all over again. Pine Bluff property owners are literally giving the city away for a bargain. And despite getting burnt by this town for the better part of four years for taking a deal just like this, John, like a housewife during a three for one sale, just cannot turn down a good deal when he sees one. But no, seriously, why is he still doing this? Why is he still buying new properties? Why is he still trying to start new businesses in Pine Bluff like this fucking go-kart track? Why is he doing all of this? Some people say it's simple sunk cost fallacy. John can't bail on Pine Bluff because he's been there for so long and poured so much money into making literally anything work in this cursed ass town that he feels like he can't cut his losses. Yeah, I think that plays a role, definitely. But I think the answer is a lot more simple and straightforward than that. I think it's a combination of John being a naturally stubborn dude when he puts his mind to it, and also a case of him just having acclimated to the city. I don't think that anything really phases John about this town anymore. He knows all the quirks. You go on his Twitter, He's just him complaining about Pine Bluff every other day, about how the city officials are retarded, about how there are thieves everywhere breaking into everything, about how the city doesn't even have drinkable water. We just noticed this about the tap water here. That is freaking gross. This is Pine Bluff water coming out of the tap. Awesome. But hey, he's still there. John is perfectly aware of how shit the state of Pine Bluff is and how unreliable the people who run it are, but he still sees potential. Potential that a normal human being who doesn't keep a monitor on him to alert people of his death so that they can put his head in cryogenic stasis for a century just can't see. We, we just don't have this man's vision. He still sees a warehouse that could be a perfect HQ for Murphy. He still sees buildings that can be rehabbed and made use of again. He still sees a community that just really needs a science museum. And maybe also a go-kart track. And he just goes, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to sue you. I'm going to sue the city of Pine Bluff for obstruction. And he actually has a good case. Because apparently, the city issued him a permit that was invalid. They gave him a worthless permit just to get him off their back. After deciding to sue the city of Pine Bluff, John then took himself back to the city council so he could explain in person why he was suing them in a speech that was so gangsta. I'm just gonna let it play. I'm not from around here and I came here with high hopes. But, like the commenter from the last city council meeting at the end of the council meeting, I've had huge problems with the inspection and zoning department. You've basically stopped me from working on my original plans, so now I've got plenty of time to poke holes and throw wrenches into every corrupt plan you hatch. Last year I purchased over 70 properties around Pine Bluff, and now I'm in a unique position to see discrepancies in code enforcement procedures. Some of my yards have been mowed, without prior notice. Some notices were posted at properties without corresponding letters being sent. I've been sent bills for work that my crew had completed, and I've been sent bills for properties where no work has been done. I also had a house demolished off of a property that I own with no notice. I can also tell you with absolute certainty that city officials have committed perjury in some of the affidavits in these documents. In short, I don't trust anything from this city and I've basically given up on this town doing the right thing without being forced to do so. 
So, you can try to collect these fees from me, but I don't care. It's no skin off my nose to let all the property I own here rot for the next 50 years while I connect all the dots about where all the tax money is really going because it sure isn't going into projects that benefit this city. Thank you. Our guy John just lit the whole building up. For once, it was him setting something else on fire and not the other way around. I can't really tell you how this story of John's is going to end, how his lawsuit is gonna turn out, how successful he'll be with running Murphy, whether or not he'll ever get to make that makerspace or science museum or go-kart track or whatever the fuck he's trying to do. But I do know that, after examining hours of this man's internet presence, that he is 100% both serious about everything he's doing. He's not a grifter, he's not a scammer, he's not a gentrifying carpetbagger trying to take advantage of a minority-run city. John Finley really does just want to move his million CDs into his building, do some science shit, and buy and restore a few rundown properties. That's it. And had he set up shop in a more reasonable town, he might have, and I might not have, made this video. But the things about shitty cities like Pine Bluff is, their local government has self-sabotaged to such an extent that you just can't win. You're not supposed to win. Unless you work for the city, embezzling federal funds, or you're a community organizer, embezzling donations, you just can't win. And in the end, even those guys don't really win. New this morning, the former director of the Pine Bluff Urban Renewal Agency is now facing serious allegations of defrauding the city out of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Public court records show Maurice Taggart faces 85 felony charges just filed yesterday, including 46 counts of forgery, 38 counts of theft of property, and one count of abusive office. And I understand that. Pine Bluff is a perfect example of a Loserville, a city where everybody from the top to the bottom loses. And so it feels like this town is being, it's just being destroyed by the vandals. I mean, these people were working hard to take all this wiring out of here. But, but in the process, the damage that they do to get copper pipes out of the walls. You know that, you know they didn't make Five dollars from the copper there. And they cause thousands of dollars of damage. This is why this town can't have nice things. Is this shit. Now with all that said, can John Finley still manage to win? I don't know. Maybe. It'd be cool if he did. But, uh... I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up. This, uh... It'll happen. It'll happen. I'm not giving up.